was laying there. The packer showed up, and he stepped through the tent. And he's like, hey, what's going on? You go, where's everything? And I said, oh, the sheep are ready. They're already started up the hill. Everything's fine. I was just waiting for you. And so we bullshit for a while, and pretty soon he's like, Leanna, no move, nothing. I was like, why? Is there a rattlesnake in my bed? Whew, good. Maybe it'll bite me and I'll get to go <laughs> to the hospital and eat Jello and watch HBO. <laughs> and he's like, he looks at me because, you know, I'm like the boss's daughter. And he's like, oh, my God. <laughs> and I and I felt it finally. It was just because I was sleeping on top of my sleep bag and I felt it on my leg and it was like moving around. And, and he's looking for the shovel. Where's the shovel? Where's the shovel? <laughs> I was like, I think I left it outside. He runs out and gets it. And I had my good bitch had just had pups and she was in the corner. And I was like, oh, my gosh, don't get my pups bit. And he looks at me again like, this is a snake. (laughs) (laughs) These are stories of outdoor adventure and expert advice from folks with calloused hands. I'm James Nash, and this is the Six Ranch Podcast. Like ranchers throughout the West, I'm spending the spring building fence, and it is an arduous task. The wire's heavy, the posts are heavy, the ground is rocky. You just break yourself into pieces. So to kind of psych myself up for the day, I pour a cup of coffee into a Stanley mug. I like the titanium series the best. And then I go out and I hammer posts into rocky ground. I stretch the wire. I get cut. You know, I try not to swear too much and I work all day long. And at the end of the day, I'm going to pour myself a cold drink into one of the coolest products that they make, which is the Lifted Spirits Prismatic Rocks Glass. When you pour your your whiskey over rocks into a glass, the, the ice melts pretty quickly, it seems like. So having that insulation makes for a better drink, in my opinion. And then these things have a prismatic cut in the stainless steel at the bottom that is also really pretty to look at. And I think that that's part of the experience of, of enjoying an ice glass of whiskey. So there's there's two times during almost every day that I'm using something from this, you know, great American company that's been around since 1913. They've got all kinds of gear on their website and you can save yourself some money by using the discount code 6ranch. That's the number 6 and the word ranch. It gets you 25% off and then there's a 6 Ranch Outfitters collection on their page. There's a link to that in this uh, podcast description. And that will take you right to a page that has all of the things that I like to use. Now, I don't make any money off this. It's not how most discount codes work. This is just a savings that I'm passing along to you. Stanley has been a sponsor of this show for years now. They've been so supportive. And if it weren't for that support, I wouldn't be able to continue doing this. So you can support the show and get a good piece of gear at a discount by using this discount code and buying something that you like or something that you think somebody else would like. So you can go to stanley1913.com, collections, Six Ranch Outfitters, or you can look at anything else on the website, but use that discount code and save yourself a couple bucks. How do you get to Temperance Creek? We would drive from White Bird over the mountain down to Pittsburgh. From Pittsburgh, we'd get out of our vehicle, unload everything into the boat, and go nine miles up the river to Temperance Creek. What kind of boat? It was, uh, we actually, we had two different ones. So uh, we had a barge boat. Mm-hmm. So if we had to bring in a lot of stuff, we'd bring it on. It had uh, two 460s in it. Okay. So it was a jet boat. And the other one is a jet boat as well. I don't remember actually what it was because we changed the engine out a couple of times in it. There's some pretty thin spots in the river between Pittsburgh and Temperance that I wouldn't want to go through in a prop really ever. No. Yeah. No. You wouldn't want to go through a prop, especially in the low season. But to be honest with you, even in the winter, like you'd get fluctuations Mm -hmm. and the river would flush. So you had... Like, so much garbage coming down right? that it would be insane. What year are we talking? Um, 
I think it was like 92 to 99, I believe. Okay. And what were you doing down there? We had the last sheep permit in the United States that was run 12 months of the year on forest service land. No kidding. I have a million questions about this. <laughs> I'm not going to get through all of them. But uh, what are some of your memories from from when you started in 92? Like there's, there's a pretty big learning curve. Yeah. So... We were used to steep country. Yeah. Um, we've been in the agriculture business and running cows and sheep for over 10 generations. We couldn't track any more back. Yeah. So we've seen a lot of different types of country. But Hell's Canyon was definitely, definitely its own breed of cat, for sure. And the first, I was talking to the kids this morning about it. The first real memory I have in there is I went in after graduating high school and uh, pretty much ruined me to go to college because I was done after that. Like you get in there and it gets in your blood and that's the end of it. Yeah. So my brother took me for a roundabout. So we ended up, uh, we were horseback. I was riding the old gray bitch and it was cold. You know, the, the cricks were froze up. And going up Temperance Creek is pretty tight. You know, you have a lot of trees and brush, you know, they're trying to come over the trail that you're always hacking back. She would literally, this mare would trot up to the creek and slide across any piece of ice she could get a chance. That's uh, a little bit disconcerting. Absolutely. You know, I've never <laughs> been on this mare before. Um, my mom had rode her, I think, uh, a few months prior to that. And she's like, I don't know about that horse, you know. And then then I got on it and I was like, holy smokes, what the heck is she doing? And Larry's like, I have no idea. Yeah, just having fun. Yeah. So then it was like, no, she's actually doing this totally on purpose, you know, once you start figuring it out. So any little piece of ice, she would just literally like trot up to it, slide across it. And then walk across the rest of it. You know, it was like no big deal. And so we went up Temperance Creek. We went up to Warnock Cabin. And then we took the high trail back over and come back down to the ranch. Well, coming down above Temperance Creek, you've got a summer trail and a winter trail. Mm -hmm. And, of course, my brother, you know, he's going to do whatever he can, you know, to scare me. You know, and he's like, yeah. He goes, I don't remember which is which. And I was like, what are you talking about? And he's like, whatever you do, just turn the reins loose. And I was like, what? Yeah. So we head over this point and literally there's probably like, I don't know, maybe 300. I bet it's 300 yards just down this bald hill. And it's nothing but just mud. Yeah. Not great conditions to be riding horse across. And it's, it's. Yeah, and it's steep. And when, when we're talking mud, we're talking like a mud slide, right? Yeah, yeah. like an elk trail, basically, is yeah. what it looks like. Yeah. Yeah, it's just a big elk trail. And that's all you see in the trail is elk tracks. Yeah. And I was like, are you sure we're on the right trail? And he's like, yeah, we're fine. And this mare <laughs> just plants her front feet and bounces with her back. She's just bouncing left to right. Yeah. All the way down this. Yikes. And you literally have to, you want to pull back on the rain so bad, you know, but you're just, you have to turn loose. Yeah. That's the time to let Jesus take the wheel and just oh, sit there. Lord. <laughs> and try and sit in the middle because you yeah. don't want to like, you know, bumper in any direction and foul up the whole thing. But wow, that was my first experience in Hell's Canyon. Yeah. We had a bull in, in Big Sheep early in the springtime that had to get get off the the benches and come down and I'm pretty sure it was my cousin Buck that went around him and pushed him maybe a little bit harder than he should have and he started sliding downhill and he locked up all four legs and I bet I could still go out there and show you the tracks on the hillside where that bull came down and we thought he was dead for sure and he blew through all the hawthorns and hackberries at the bottom and we could hear barbed wire screeching and it's like 
oh my god we just killed the bull and then he just walked out of the meadow like it was a tuesday no big deal yeah but, yeah that's uh that's a good good introduction to to steep country and hells yeah getting to absolutely do a bobsled ride with a with a horse that likes sliding on ice i had a little grula well it wasn't all that little but i had a grula gelding that loved water so we were crossing the river here on the ranch all the time moving cattle around and you had to budget like an extra half hour of time because if you rode into the river with him he was just going to play in it until he was done like you couldn't get him out of it and he would play in the water until he got it in his ears and then he'd fold whichever ear had gotten the water in it like kind of back into the side like not like he was mad but just didn't like it and then he'd pout for the rest of the day <laughs> and oh just go back gosh. to work but yeah yeah we had a something about happy. great horses and we didn't realize he was night blind hmm. and it took us forever to even actually realize that because it wasn't really you know you're on your number one string he was on like the third string maybe and uh there was a there's a point just below the house and when the water's high the trail like disappears under this rock and so they have to go over the rock and when you know the river's low then they they use the the lower one well he was so used to using I think the lower one all the time and we didn't know this but you know we'd have the horses turned out in that pasture and that appy ended up getting across the river I don't know how many times and he'd always show back up right across from the house and be over there nickering. And so we'd have to take the jet boat over and catch him and then drag him back. But as soon as he got in the water, he would literally just fold over sideways. And you had to pull, keep his head up out of the water, mm. you know, and tie it off to the boat so he wouldn't drown. And it was like, I don't know how many times we brought that horse back. I mean, a bajillion. So did you swim him back or did he get in the boat? He would swim. Yeah. Yeah, we'd swim. Not all the time did we have the barge boat in because then, you you know, people don't understand that as soon as the boat's in the water, that thing's trying to, it's trying to sink. I don't yeah. care who you are. <laughs> thing's trying to sink all the time. So, um, and it takes a lot of battery to keep bilging all the water out. And so if it right. runs out of battery, then it sinks. And then if the water goes down, then it's low. Then when the water comes back up, your batteries are dead and your boat's under the water. So you had a leaky barge. Oh yeah, that you know, trying to keep the leaks out of out of boats, you know, there's always rocks moving in that river. Yeah, and so, and I don't think people quite understand how bad it is, but yeah, so you you hit rocks. You do. Uh, I was talking with Adam Stein about this years ago when I had first gotten a jet boat, and you know, Adam's somebody that that I look up to, and uh, and he's run the rivers a lot, and I was like, have you ever hit a rock? And he goes, of course I've hit a rock. It's like if you run rivers, you hit rocks all the time. Yeah, it it, it is something that happens, and I too now have hit rocks, <laughs> but not hard enough to put a hole in my boat or or even dent a boat. But anything that you hit that isn't water gets your full attention pretty quickly. Hundred percent. Yeah. Yeah. So many experiences on the river. Actually, I don't think I've been in a boat since. Really? Yeah. And you know, it it would be sounds like you're okay with that. Boats are always trying to go under. <laughs> and sheep are always trying to die. And sheep are always trying to die. Yeah. And, yeah. Um, and and we had so many, like, near-death experiences on that. And, matter of fact, one of the last trips out, of, you know, we were getting the bucks out, we were getting the horses out and the milk cow out. And so, Mom and I actually um, took a bunch of it down the trail and dad was in the barge boat and of course you know it was late fall the water's low which you know you're always watching the river and how how high it is how low it is you know it depends on how you take different canals how you do to handle things differently whether you got a load you don't have a load how much water they're letting out of the dam at the moment i'm pretty sure there's a psychotic person working that valve yeah. Pretty certain of that. It's you, definitely a moody. Very moody. Very yeah. moody. You have no idea. No idea which direction it's going in and who's who's controlling that for sure. But anyway, uh so many they're they're at Kirby. We were taking some mm. stuff some what did we have on? We had the bucks on, actually, taking them out. 
And dad was nervous because he'd already hit a couple of rocks. He's like, yeah, there's a rock there and there, you know, because the water was so low. Yeah. And you know how it kind of shoots, you know, it's really wide, but there's just that one little canal that you have to hit. Yep. So I had the kids and they were, they were babies. I'm thinking Brietta might've been three and Trevor was two. They might've been younger. And, uh, I said, uh, dad, we got to get the kids out of here. And he's like, yeah, I think we do. Cause he and I both knew that we were, this was, this was not going to look good. Mm. So we pulled some random boat over. So how many sheep did you have in the boat? Uh, maybe 40. <laughs> <laughs> That's a lot. There, I think there was 40. Okay. And so, uh. We pull over at Kirby, we pull this guy over, and I was like, I literally, I told him, I said, take my mom, take my kids, and go in front of us, please. Hmm. Just meet us down at Temper- at Pittsburgh. Yeah. I said, please don't let him watch this, you know? And he, <laughs> sure enough, the guy backs out, and he's going to follow us. Oh, no. And I'm just like, oh, my Lanta. So we start down, and we hit that first little rapid and the whole barge boat tips to the front to actually, like, fall in that canal. Yikes. So when it falls, all the bucks come to the front of the boat. Our jets are out of the water. Dad doesn't have any control of the boat. He's throwing his hands in the air. And he's like, push him, push him. Well, I don't know if you've ever tried pushing sheep when you really need to, but it doesn't happen. And so I'm shoving <laughs> on these big, you know, 300-pound, 350-pound bucks. And they're, they're fat. They don't want to go anywhere. <laughs> They're jammed up on the front gate. I'm shoving. I'm yelling. I'm screaming. And the dog, she's biting everything. Pretty soon, I get bit. She bites me because we're. I'm in a panic. Sure. Right? Yeah. Why not? <laughs> we're literally gonna bounce up against the rocks, and uh, lo and behold, I don't know. Something shifted, and they finally moved back a little. And we got room. We got down to Pittsburgh and unloaded the box. And Dad's like. Holy shit. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, Trying to uh, herd sheep with a dog inside of a boat. That is quite an image in a rapid when things aren't going well. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And when you got all the weight in the front, you know, like they shift. And we've done horses and mules in the boat a lot. And um, it's kind of funny how they all, they act different. Yeah. You know, all the the different perceptions that they have. You know, you never know. Like we put them in horse trailers all the time, but... Not everybody puts them in a boat. <laughs> yeah. Uh, you know, I've got that, that cargo jet out there, and I had Dad down in Hells, and we are hooked up to a, a pretty big sturgeon, and uh, and the water temperature was just right for that fish to basically never get tired. And we'd, we'd fought him about a mile and a half downriver, and we are getting into a section that was going to have rapids for the next two miles. You know, there wasn't another eddy coming up. And I said, all right, dad, like now's the time we really need to beat this fish. And he got up in the very front of the boat and he lifted as hard as he could as we were slipping into this outside bend. And I was just kind of idling along, you know, watching the waves, trying to, you know, watch dad and watch the fish. And I, I pushed on the throttle a little bit because my stern was about to get into the rocks and dad was pulling on that fish so hard that my pumps came out of the water as well and I had nothing. I just immediately hit the rev limiter. Yeah, you panic, huh? I was like, it's like a panic mo- panic I'm, time. I'm a dead boat. I was like, <laughs> dad, come towards me. And he's like, what? <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> yeah, you. Uh... I needed a sheepdog to get around him. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, a lot of, a lot of definitely. Yeah, but sturgeon fever, holy cow, there's another one that you just, I remember when I, yeah, sturgeon fever, I had it for a long time until I finally got one in the first one, dad, dad went down, him and mom would have toddies on the porch, and then uh, he, he went down with me for the first, I don't know, week, I was diligent, morning, night, I was down there, <laughs> Dad's like, I sure hope you catch one of them damn things, because you really are <laughs> screwing up our plans. And, uh, at the first one I hooked, he was actually with me and it was about a 16 foot sturgeon. No kidding. Those fish don't exist there anymore. He jumped up out of the water and did the 
fin dance on top, and it was just in, just in front of the rapid, hmm. right before Temperance. And he danced on the on the top of the water, and I look over at Dad, you know, because he said there was big fish, but like you know, yeah. everybody's idea of a big fish you know, was right. different. This thing jumped out of the water and danced, and I looked over at Dad. Dad just was like. Real that's out of a bed, real. <laughs> <laughs> so I was reeling. Pretty soon he hot foots down to me. He's like, give me that goddamn road. <laughs> he starts running down the river. But there was no way once he got through the rapids. You you, no. just, you can't even turn something like that. You know, no. they're huge. You really need their cooperation to reel them in. 100%. Yeah. 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 Like they just have to get tired of it enough that they're like, all right, you can come take the hook out of me now. Oh, uh, yeah. Yeah. Because, you know, if even like a... I don't know, five or six foot, or there's so much current. If yeah. they were to have a heart attack and die, you're not getting that fish in. You just can't do it. No. It's, it's too much weight. Oh, yeah. They they pull so hard, so hard. That happens with marlin. So where I lived in North Carolina, they would fish marlin off the continental shelf, which was around 70 miles offshore. Mm-hmm. And they would uh, take um, like, like one gallon, you know, tin cans and fill them with concrete Mm -hmm. and they'd use that as a weight and you know they'd drop baits a thousand feet down or something like that and then when you hook a fish up then your concrete breaks off and you're fighting the fish but some of those fish would have heart attacks or whatever and and die down there you know a thousand fifteen hundred feet deep and you're spending the rest of your day which feels like the rest of your life getting that fish up to the surface oh yeah we had fought some for you know, so long, yeah. so long. And they they end up going down there and just rolling so much and is what we found out. And um, they'd your line would come in and it's just absolutely ratted from the rocks, yeah. you know, because they just go to the bottom and they just roll and roll like an alligator. And mm-hmm. it's crazy. But yeah. the fight, it gets in your blood, man. <laughs> They're incredible. I, I don't like to reel them in anymore, but I really, really love to – to have the experience of, of seeing somebody else catch one. Um, Even seeing them. Seeing them, you know, get, getting in the water with them and, and getting yeah. to put your hands on this just super cool fish. And like I said, the fish, like what you experience, those don't exist there anymore. Um, they get handled by, by fisheries from Idaho Power, from Idaho Fish and Game, from Nez Perce Fisheries, from NOAA Fisheries, from Oregon Department of Fish and Wildlife, these fish are getting surveyed all the time. And those bumps that go down their sides are called scoots. And if they've been surveyed, they cut off the second scoot on the left side. And besides some of the the little fish that I've caught, I've never caught a big fish down there that hasn't been surveyed. Hmm. And the biggest one that they've gotten in their survey is 10 and a half feet. Wow. And that is a gargantuan fish oh they're huge that i guarantee you that fish wouldn't have fit in this room yeah. that i cooked i right. mean it was just amazing yeah and this is uh gosh i should remember because i built this thing but i think we're uh <laughs> what are we i think we're 16 16 feet long this room so oh yeah yeah, yeah. it's a good metric so sheep are always trying to die and hell's canyon is one of the most hostile places that that i've been in that wasn't a war zone how do you keep sheep alive down there? So. How many sheep were you running? We went in with 2,200. Okay. And did you trail them in in the summertime? We would trail them in from uh, the Eagle Caps and they would. Is that 80 miles? Yeah. 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 And the backside would be like Duck Lakes. So that was part of the permit as okay. well. Wow. So, um, and then up into, you know, the North Fork and the South Fork in Naha, their boner flat was like mm-hmm. the top. And then actually right next to where the gondola was, you could actually tend camp from the gondola mm. on the on this side. Wow. That's a that's a massive area. Huge. Yeah. Uh what was it like managing predators? I, I had two sheep killed uh, you know, three hundred yards from the studio here. Uh either last night or or the night before by coyotes and that's that's really hard on me and that that's really small scale compared to you know sheep losses 
but that's that's my own failure to protect these animals and with with hunting being my profession to have an animal that I can hunt year round kill livestock that belongs to this ranch um I mean I'm I'm gonna kill coyotes tonight like I'm gonna do my damnedest but I mean you've got lots of bears especially in the eagle caps you've got cougars you've got coyotes didn't have to deal with wolves at the time nope it didn't Thank have to God. deal with wolves that was the one the one there was wolves there yeah were there yeah and especially on the seven devil side we had talked to the sheep herders over there sure and uh they had ran into a den mm -hmm. so there they were yeah there's always been something around you yeah. know here and there did you carry um, a gun with you yeah carried a gun what do you carry uh 243 it's a great rifle good rifle i was used to it um we did pack 3030s mm -hmm. um it just kind of depended on how many bullets you had or whatever yeah <laughs> that's a sheep herder classic it's a sheep herder classic and uh that I mean, I've killed anything I've ever wanted to with 243. It's all about bullet placement, right? So, but the, I, I honestly, I don't know where to start with the whole cheap death thing. Um, so you're lambing them out there at Temperance Creek mm -hmm. and they go from, you know, a lambing pot to, you know, a small like four by four pin we call jugs. Yep. And then from the jugs, we'd put them out into a little bit bigger pin, and we'd put maybe, you know, four or five together. And then from four or five, you're going to double that, double that, double that, double that, until they're in the big pot. And then you have a band that you would take up the hill. So you got these little lambs, and if you don't keep them moving, mm -hmm. then the, all the lambs would want to come back to where they had sucked. Yep. So... You know, keeping them moving helps them stay with their mom and realize that, you know, you're not going to be in that same little spot. It's the same with cows, too. You know, I mean, you see people have trouble with the same thing. You know, they keep them in the same pasture for too long. And then you try to move pastures and you got a wad of calves that come back. And so you get the run back. Yeah. Well, we'd, we'd get that, too, from time to time, especially depending on how many herders you had in there and whether, you know, how how tied up we were with lambing and, and that whole process. But we'd get them out. We'd get them up on the hill. And, of course, the bears are just waking up. Yep. Green grass. And so the bears would be our biggest hit. Mm -hmm. um, were you killing bears anytime you saw them? Uh, no. No, he didn't kill bears. We, yeah. You know, that's the whole thing I think that people get kind of hung up on is that livestock people are just out there to murder everything. Mm -hmm. <laughs> we we don't. We, we love to see wildlife just as much as anyone else. And, actually, we get to see it a lot more. So I think we appreciate it more. Yeah. So and that's no. the, that's the reason that I ask is because it is it is a misnomer. It's it something is. that people don't understand. It's huge. Yeah. Yeah. And sheepmen probably get the biggest bear of that. I mean, I've heard people say, oh, yeah, the sheepmen, they've been putting out poison for years. And I'm thinking, what? Yeah. <laughs> Not in my time. Right. <laughs> and. Yeah, you guys see everything and shoot everything and whatever, and that, that's not it either. And we, I've seen so many different bear stories, lion stories, you name it, than probably most people. We did end up shooting seven lions mm. in there at Temperance Creek within three months. Wow. And that was for service, um, had given us the issue to okay to do that. Right. Um. That was, and they were just, they were just camped in there. They were solid. They had, you know, killed, I don't know, like 20 bucks and it. And a buck is. A male sheep. Yep. And, uh, but we'd get the sheep up on the hill and the bears would start hammering us. Um, the first couple of years we were in there, we would lose around 350 lambs in a year. It was huge. Brutal. Very brutal. Very brutal. Then we got some white guard dogs. Mm -hmm. What kind? Great, great Pyrenees. Yeah. And we had two males and two females. And um, that first year, our number dropped down to 50, which is totally acceptable. I mean, when you think about being out, these, these animals are out there with contending with bears and coyotes and rattlesnakes. 
Sure. And I didn't even think about snake bites. That snake probably... bites were huge. I remember our worst thing was up there above um, Wagner, uh, Warnock Cabin, um, right up there at the base of Temperance Creek. We had a campsite above there. Um, we pulled in. It was me and the camp tender. And we were literally setting up camp. And we looked over and the sheep are just jumping and acting really weird and running. And so we went over there and there was a pot. We, they, we must have got into a den of rattlesnakes. Mm. And we had, before we got, we didn't even, we loaded everything back up on the mules. And we're like, we got to get out of here. And before we even got out of there, there was 15 dead. Wow. Yikes. I, yeah, my pulse just jumped 20 beats. Just thinking about uh, snake dens. I do not like rattlesnakes. I don't handle that well. That's, uh, yeah, that's, I don't either. That's in my, my genetics. Um, I've done my best to fight it. I got a pet snake in college. Tried to make friends with him. Didn't help. Uh, yeah, scared of snakes. Think I always will be. Had one in my bed once. Yikes. Yeah, we had... Was that something your brother did or did... No, no. <laughs> no. Have you ever slept in a cot munch? Lots. Yeah. So we were... We would be in a cot six months out of the year. Yeah. I hate cots. I don't... Sl- I sleep on my belly. Mm. You know, you're supposed to like sleep in this little like, you know cubby thing I just don't I don't do well with it you know I'm fighting it I'm halfway out of the cot (laughs) it just doesn't work for me so I took my cot and I got rid of the cot and I fold it up and put it in the corner and I just lay my my sleeping bed my whole mani down on the ground Mm -hmm. and I did that all the time I I sent the cot back to the ranch because I it was useless in the tent I hated it yeah so I was laying in bed. I just uh, fought the sheep. It was raining. Anyone knows if you have sheep and it's raining, then they run more to keep warm. Mm -hmm. So they were running a lot. And uh, I was down there on Sand Creek. And we were getting ready to move camp that day. And so I knew the packer was coming in. And I thought, well, I had a rough morning. I'd been up since like 430 I was like, I'm going to take a little nap before the packer gets here. So I'm laying in bed out. I'd had a tough three days. It rained for three solid days, and it was rough. And, you know, some places you can ride a horse there real easy, and other places you're better off afoot. Sure. So I'd been on a foot a lot. Yeah. And uh, anyway, I was laying there the packer showed up and he stepped through the tent and he's like hey what's going on you go where's everything and I said all oh, the sheep are ready they're already started up the hill everything's fine I was just waiting for you and so we bullshit for a while and pretty soon he's like Leanna no move nothing I was like why is there a rattlesnake in my bed Whew, good maybe it'll bite me and I'll get to go <laughs> to the hospital and eat jello and watch HBO <laughs> he's like he looks at me because you know I'm like the boss's daughter and he's like Oh my God. <laughs> and I, and I felt it finally. It was just cause I was sleeping on top of my sleep bag and I felt it on my leg and it was like moving around and, and he's looking for the shovel. Where's the shovel? Where's the shovel? <laughs> I was like, I think I just left it outside. He runs out and gets it. And I had my good bitch had just had pups and she was in the corner and I was like, Oh my gosh, don't get my pups bit. And he looks at me again. Like this is a snake. <laughs> <laughs> He fought panicked, but yeah, it was pretty funny. We laughed about it for a long time. I said, so I'd ask him every time. I said, okay, you keep telling me we go Mas Alto, Mas Alto, and no snakes. And he's like, yep, yeah, yep, yeah, no snakes in this next camp, Leon. No snakes. <laughs> <laughs> and the next camp, there'd be snakes. And the next camp, there'd be snakes. I was like, oh my gosh. Was he Vasco? No, Peruvian. Peruvian. Yeah, we had all Peruvians. Okay. They do a good job? Very good job. Yeah. Very good job. Yeah. Yeah, I think my family is, we've we've had all kinds of different nationalities for sheep herders. My parents were in Nevada, mm-hmm. and they'd run 10,000 sheep over there, so for a guy, and and uh, yeah, I've seen all kinds of French, French Basque, yeah. Basque, Peruvian, Mexican. Who's the best? You know, I you can't, that that's, that's a non-negotiable thing. That's a personality thing. 
So is there a best individual that you ever worked with? Yes. Yes. To bar in Nevada. He was, he got down to, I think it was about 80 head of sheep. All coal use, which mm-hmm. old, no teeth, you know, dyers. You want to call dyers? That's a, that's a coal. I mean, they're, they're literally like a nursing home deal. Right. He took that bunch of sheep and never lost a one. Mm. He went through a case of penicillin, I believe. <laughs> he never yeah. lost a one. He was like, I remember too, he, he had such a big heart and that's what it takes. It takes a really big heart and, and someone who really enjoys it, likes the sheep, likes tending them, likes caring for them. You know, you're, you're not only trying to find them good feed, good pasture, you know, you're trying to keep them in, you know, easier spots to be able to herd and watch. And he loved it. Absolutely loved it. He had eight sisters that were all nuns. He sent all of his money home. Nobody wanted to go to town with him to shop because he would literally have hundreds of dollars of bills in his pocket, big old wad. And he'd pull this wad out and he'd look at what he wanted to buy. And he was literally like dropping money as he went. So you'd have to go behind him and pick up all this money behind him the whole time. And uh, just what a character. But he loved kids. He loved sheep. He loved dogs. He loved it all. Loved livestock, loved wildlife. You know, he had a hankering for blackbirds. Mm. He would shoot blackbirds and eat them. Something he come from at yeah. home. Um, but yeah, but if he wounded one, he'd bring it to my mom and my mom had to nurse it back to health. Wow. And then he'd turn it loose. That's a big heart. Yeah. (laughs) And some of those complexities, I think, are the hardest things to explain to people who aren't involved in hunting and agriculture. Mm -hmm. Like, How do you... If, if you live in town and you've only ever bought your food from a store, how could you understand that? You couldn't. You couldn't because it's, it's too complex. You know, once you, even as a single person, you know, your idealism of what food is is so much different than when you have kids. And then once you have kids, then you're, you're you know, making sure that you have meals for the next week. And, you know, what are we going to eat and the health health part of it and, you know, whether it's natural and whether it's, you know, had something else done to it, whether they, you know, how they process it, you know, what they do with it. Chicken, terrible thing. I hardly ever eat chicken. Maybe once or twice a year. <laughs> I really don't eat chicken. My kids love it, but I, I'm not crazy about it. But the things they do to chicken blows my mind. Yeah. And I can eat home raised chicken. But I can't eat processed chicken. It makes my gums swell. I don't know what's in it. What What's the big difference? I have no idea. The it's so cheap to to buy. Like, and I know it's a loss leader, but you know Costco. It's like what is it, seven or eight bucks to mm-hmm. to buy a whole chicken. I if if I were to raise a chicken here, a meat chicken, and and pay to have it processed and packaged it would probably cost me 30 or $35 mm-hmm. just to, to, to buy the grain and, and to, to feed that chicken out. Um, so for somebody to be able to do it for, you know, the, these really small amounts of money, um, I just don't, I don't know. I don't think it's that healthy. Well, and it's a pride thing too, right? I mean, I don't know one rancher, one farmer who who knows what the quality is of what you can get at the store mm-hmm. and what you can raise at home. Right. It's just a huge difference in flavor and you know what's happened with the animal. You know how it was taken care of. You know how loved it was. I mean, I don't think people really understand the whole process of, say, even the sheep. You you have your genetics is huge. The whole science behind that is amazing, and we love it. Um, 
but then you have to find, you know, the, the buck that's going to breed the you. Then you have the whole time you have to wait, the vaccinations, the different things that you have to do, the care, the, the pneumonia that can take a loss at stuff. And then you're, you're up all night, 24 hours a day with these animals waiting for them, you know, to lamb. If they have any troubles, you know, you're dealing with those troubles as they come. Then they hit the ground and you have to make sure that they have the nutrients there and that, you know, that they can get milk and there's plenty of milk and there's science and DNA behind that. And then you get the animal a little bit farther down and you're going through the marking and the docking and all that stuff, which people, that's another thing, docking. People have a hell of a time with that. And it's like, well, they've never obviously seen an animal die of maggots or flies because, you know, they get, they get a lot of manure on there and it gets all crusty and wet and you get the right temperature and you can get maggots that'll just wipe out sheep like you wouldn't believe. So t- tail docking is definitely important. And then you get the whole thing of going through the whole summer of making sure and your hands on. It's not, you know, we run cows too, but the sheep, you're there 24 hours a day. They have to be babysat because they literally, you know, the eagles, the hawks, the birds, they're trying to take them out. The coyotes are trying to take them out. You know, everything's trying to take them out. You give them moldy hay and they'll abort. You know, you give them, you can give them bean, corn. You actually feed sheep beans up until they lamb. As soon as they lamb, you can't feed them beans. They'll start to dry up. Mm. And as soon as a sheep lambs, they're immediately starting to, they can dry. And you can't bring them back like you can a cow. As in they're not producing milk anymore. Not producing milk. The milk starts shutting down as soon as they start lambing. So if you don't if you don't have all your nutrients and stuff and you're holding that good, then your milk goes down and you can't pull it back. Mm. So, yeah, you really have to babysit these things in order to produce a good animal at the end of the year. And, and that's there's a lot of pride that goes into producing, you know, anything, right. whether it's a vegetable or whether it's a calf or a lamb, you know, you're just, you're super proud at the end of the year. I don't, I don't know of anybody that you don't walk around and they're like, Oh yeah, look at this calf, you know, look at how it grew. God, that's a good cow. You know, I mean, everyone's proud sure. of whatever they grow. So I think the understanding of all of that versus trying to buy it at a grocery store, is just, it's just not there. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Do you like eating lamb? Yes. How about mutton? Absolutely. How do you like mutton? I've I've yet to have it that I lo- that I liked it, and I think it's probably because it wasn't made right. Correct. Yeah. It's all about cooking it. So low and slow. Low and slow. Low and slow. Lots of garlic. Lots of garlic. Lots of thyme. Oh yeah. 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 So and and to be honest with you, probably the best the kids are wanting it now is a Dutch oven. Like I was raised in sheep camp, cow camp, and we always had Dutch ovens. I don't know how many times, you know, dad would have hunters show up and, you know, there might be like 10 hunters show up and mom's like, are you guys hungry? And they're like, well, yeah. And they're looking around, but oh, don't, don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. We understand you're in camp. You know, you probably don't have something like that. That's fine. She's like, oh no, grab the shovel. Yeah. <laughs> so she takes them over and dig right there <laughs> and pull out a whole pot of, you know, a leg of lamb. You know, it's been cooking all day. All that stuff's just, it's melting your mouth. Goodness. So you guys buried Dutch ovens uh-huh. to cook with them? Yeah, I didn't know how to do it with the briquettes. Mm. Like, I, I've seen that now, you know, at different different outings and stuff, you know, that they bring in, you know, cooking crews. And it's it's really cool. They can do it with briquettes. I never knew that. Yeah. When I've uh, buried them, it's been it's been times when I'm out elk hunting or something, and I want to have dinner ready when I come back. Mm-hmm. So first thing in the morning, yep. I'll start my fire, put my f- food in there, bury it, and then when I come back that night, it's good to go. I started putting. Um, I had a tire chain that uh, that didn't fit a tire that I owned anymore, mm-hmm. so I'd throw that in the bottom of the hole before I put my coals on it and it would keep it hot that much longer all that mm. extra metal mass in there but it is pretty mama ama- do rocks what's that mama do rocks yeah, for sure but it, it's pretty incredible to come back at the end of a day when you've been hunting all day or whatever and you know grab your shovel and knock the dirt off the top of this thing and you pull that lid open and all the steam and smell, smell rolls out of it smell it's like oh my gosh and you eat that and you've got about five minutes to get in your sleeping bag and, 
and <laughs> you know you're done <laughs> yeah yeah i don't think there's anything better than than eating out like that that's for sure i mean yeah you come in and you're cold and you've had a hard day and yeah and you you go over there and you're digging in the ground with a flashlight trying to dig this meal out and you're hoping to god you know because you you know you literally if you think about it you're shoving that in in the morning mm-hmm. and then at night you're coming back thinking is this going to be death of it just burnt crispies you right know? <laughs> yeah. yeah or did my fire go out yeah and it didn't cook or yeah mom would always say make sure it's not smoking make sure it's not smoking and so yeah we'd you know have to make sure that you didn't have any little smoke plumes coming up mm-hmm. and make sure you tamped it in good and yeah you dig something out of the ground and oh my gosh the stews yeah i don't know what it is but there's nothing better or bread we'd bake bread in it there's still some places in Iceland where the geothermal activity is so close to the ground because they've got so much volcanic going on that uh, they can just dig a hole in the ground and drop a Dutch oven in it and bake bread without adding fire to it. Oh, that would be crazy. Wouldn't that be fun, making some volcano bread? That would be crazy. Yeah. Yeah, yeah outside of uh, Ely, there's some what they call the Coke ovens. Hmm. And that's what, yeah, the guys would do that there. There's just these little, like... I, and I remember being a lot. I haven't been back there since I was a kid, but I'm telling you, those those sheep herders know how to make bread too. Yeah. Holy smokes! Yeah. Now their breakfasts are always questionable. I <laughs> I've never seen anything like a sheep herder breakfast, but it could be absolutely most of it. It was like a glass. I remember this one guy, and I was a little kid, and I was watching him <laughs> make this stuff, and it was like coffee went in. And I don't know, probably a half a cup or better of hot cocoa, all in a glass. Uh-huh. And he'd mix that up and then then went in raw eggs. Okay. And he'd mix that up. And if he had cookies or anything in it, went. Yeah. I mean, so it was just like, you know, it was like this slurry of God only knows what. And he's like, oh, yeah, you want some? You want some? And I'm thinking, mm-mm. That, that isn't even probably good, you know. Like, there's there's nothing that, you put raw eggs in? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's really good. You try, you try. No way. <laughs> uh, did you ever meet Benny Banks? Uh-uh. When I started guiding up here in, in the Eagle Caps, he was the, the camp cook for the pack station. He was 86 years old. He rode this uh, this unect mare that had, uh, I, I think elk ran through when he had it out on a picket line and the the mare ended up falling down and having its neck cranked around all night long mm-hmm. and had a big divot in its neck um and i can't remember for sure but it could only turn its head one direction so on those switchbacks you wanted to be riding it on the switchback where it could turn its head to see where it was going oh yeah but you know as an 86 year old man he could Get, he could ride all day long, but he could only get on and off of his horse once a day. <laughs> <laughs> and he made Benny Banks stew, and he had a great big cauldron. And whatever was left over from dinner went in the stew, and the, the stew cooked continuously for a 10-day camp. And the first couple of days, Benny Banks stew wasn't too bad. By the end of it, it You're was questioning. It was a little wild. It was a little <laughs> wild. So we always joked around because we had, we had this guy is, and he was it was a buckaroo. He was famous for his beans, and he did the beans the same way. So you started off with a pot of beans, yep. and you were still eating on that same pot. Magic. Yeah, magic beans. all summer long. Like, you couldn't even <laughs> throw them out. Like, that would be because you were like, oh, man, I could really just pitch this to the dogs right now. And, oh, gosh, he'd have had a heart attack. No. So you ate these beans. And so the the question was before you, where I sat down was, was there big bubbles or little bubbles? <laughs> like, I want to know the <laughs> boiling status on this stuff. <laughs> uh, so... You know, you were moving sheep from close to 10,000 feet to down around, I imagine temperance is 1,100, 1,200 feet elevation. Mm -hmm. Um, Were you really moving them seasonally so that you're staying with that, with that green line? Were you moving up high in the summer and coming back down in the fall? Correct. Yes. We'd follow, you follow the snow up. And I think one of the things that my kids most remember is being up on the Eagle Caps, you know, they they would go play in the snow. Mm-hmm. 
I mean, so many times they played in the snow. And that's where we keep our caches. You know, we'd go find a good snow bank and throw our cache in there. What's a cache? A uh, cache of food. Yeah. So our meat, maybe, mm-hmm. or... You know, because you were in there, it's not like you went to town very often, so you kind of had to pre-plan. And uh, we throw our cash in the snowbank, then we go up, and the kids would be in snow fights and play in the snow and slide down. And matter of fact, they they remembered. I think after we moved out, one of the first things was they we were down at the down in Burns on the refuge, and we were eating their pepper weed down there with the sheep. And that's a whole nother story. But the kids would look up fondly, you know, at the Steens Mountains, and they're like. Can we go? Can we go to the snow? Mm. Well, no, no, we can't. Well, we have a horse. Like, you yeah. know, that's the, the, that was their mode of transportation, you know. But yeah, all all that was, uh, and and putting milk. We had milk caches that we'd throw in the creeks and streams, and you know, and leave them there, and then come back and get them. And you know, that was our refrigerator, so we used that quite a bit. So you had a milk cow. You mentioned that earlier. We did. I, I, we had a milk cow in it, Temperance Creek, and and milked her. Um, save the cream. Yeah. Butter. Yeah, you had all kinds of things. And what doesn't, you know, if it goes bad, then you give it to the chickens and the dogs. And there's there's like a process to all of it. What was the wildlife like in Hell's at the time? So, the elk and the deer and. Mm-hmm. Yeah, we got to watch them so many nights. A lot of elk come down, and uh, we got to see where the bulls would all pull off and, and go over on the seven devils. They never stayed on the Oregon side. They'd always go on the Idaho side. Um, turkeys, we got in trouble, actually, from, well, they tried to get us in trouble. We had uh, we had turkeys there, you know, Thanksgiving, Christmas, turkey, so... And an extra, and they were they were going in the creek. It would be so hot that these turkeys would go over to the creek and literally give them water baths. Mm-hmm. I've never seen birds do that before. Um, the lions would come in. We actually had a big, huge rope swing um, just behind the house up the creek in the trees and uh, got to use it quite a bit until the lions found it. And it used to be like this big knot mm-hmm. that you know made a good seat, you know, probably a foot across. And the lions ended up playing with that so much. They had a hole dusted up underneath it, <laughs> and it literally had shrunk. We actually still have it. Yeah. We cats like, are just cats. Aren't they? Yeah. Just big kitties. Yeah. They really are. Um, a lot of bears. So we get to see a lot of hunters, too. And uh, we pointed some hunters in, some, in a direction one time up Temperance Creek. Temperance Creek was loaded. And this guy, he come back and he's like, I counted 152 bear today. Wow. I was like, you weren't in one spot, were you? (laughs) 152 bear. Um, We did go. And in the wintertime, you know, like there wasn't a whole lot to do. You're feeding sheep once a day and that's about it. So we would sneak off and do different things. We'd go uh, looking for bear caves. And uh, sneak in on them and listen to them snore. Mm -hmm. That was a blast. We had so much fun with that. Yeah. Seeing who was brave enough to go in there and tap the bear. (laughs) They wake up pretty quick, don't they? (laughs) They can, and some of them don't. Oh, really? Yeah, it's weird. You know, it must depend on how how they are, you know, in the sleep or something, you know, whether they're kind of coming out of it or they're dead sleep. But, yeah, and the snoring. Mm -hmm. Oh, I wish I had a recording of it. You know, we did that so many times. There was a lot of lot of little bear dens up through there, that's for sure. It's funny because so much of that has changed. You know, I spent I spent four days up hells a month ago. Um, I think I saw ten deer. Uh, what? <laughs> they're almost gone. No way. Oh yeah. Huh. So the bunch grass is largely gone. Um, wow. And I think that the the removal of sheep from that ecosystem largely destroyed it, and yeah. it, it's no longer it's no longer good habitat. Um, and I, I say good habitat. There's lots of places that there's there's plenty of habitat left, but it's so diminished from what it was when it was being grazed, and 
the removal of livestock from Hell's Canyon has hurt wildlife in a way that it, I don't think it's irreparable, but it hurt it bad. It hurt it really bad. So what, what ended your guys's permit? So, yeah, just listening to you there, it just, it blows my mind that so many people think that having grazing animals on federal land of any kind, whether it's Forest Service or BLM, is such a sin. I don't think they understand how in love we are with the land. Just because we have a permit and you're renting it, basically, or leasing it, they don't understand what kind of heart and soul that we care about for the whole land. And and that includes wildlife. It's not like any, we, we all love wildlife, whether it's birds or well, snakes. Snakes would be my only <laughs> little, little tidbit there. But, and, and the chucker, the chucker that we'd see in there was just mind blowing. You know, like I remember riding through and the coveys of chucker, there'd be so many babies flying through the air that you could stick your hand out, catch a baby and turn it loose. I mean, it was just magical yeah you know or the bear and being able to see it was kind of interesting to see what they ate Mm. you know like what do they eat when there's nothing the babies aren't there the you know the fawns aren't out right nothing started and you'd see them eating the cactus Mm. and they would literally like peel the stickers off and eat the middle part Mm. and then pick stickers out of their feet and the whole thing was so fun and probably nobody's going to get to experience that again. And then if you don't have the livestock there, what's what's the option? Fire. Yeah. Which, and which we've seen, you know, which we had... we've seen so much fire come through and fire was doesn't it... just burn grass and trees. It annihilates everything, every bug, every bird, every wildlife animal. I mean, it's it's so crazy that we feel that that's natural, but they don't see it as a natural disaster. Right. They just see it as natural. Something that I I was really surprised by on my trip down there this spring as I could see all the green coming up, um, at Somers where it had burned. Mm. And when I rolled in there, I was like, Oh, this, this looks really, really good. And then I stayed there for a few days and all of the wildlife that I saw was on the old feet. Nothing was in the fresh green. And I, I didn't hike up there to see what was growing back, but I have a feeling it wasn't grass or it wasn't palatable or something because, you know, the, the deer that I saw, like they should have been in that fresh green stuff. Yeah. But for whatever the reason, tender. they were, they were eating what was coming back up in the sand drop seed and, and in, in the bunch of grass that's still there. And, you know, those, those early annuals, you know, they're, they're eating that stuff. But so then what happened is the bighorn started dying off. Hmm. And so when the bighorn started dying off, they realized that there was basically a type of pneumonia. Mm -hmm. And they said basically it was from domestic sheep. Yep. So we tried getting them to come in and test our sheep. Yep. Um, They wouldn't. Really? No. We wanted them all tested to see if, because it would have been easy for us to have them tested to see if they're carriers or not. If they are, we could have gotten rid of them. If they weren't, then we had a go-go, and the only thing that we bring in new would have been bucks, and they could have been easily tested before they even come on site. Yep. And so um, the bighorns just, I think, were have been tended to more than what they thought they could turn them loose and have them just go. Then they realized that the bighorns um, later could catch it from other animals. Mm -hmm. Elk were carriers. A lot of other animals were carriers. Um, But it was was this type of pneumonia that they wanted all the sheepmen kicked out. Basically, um, everybody that was involved with the the sheep in Hell's Canyon, um, all the sheepmen that had different bands, have all passed on now. 
my parents, um, Ben Howard, um, I can't think of the other one, but, and it was all based on this type of pneumonia. Um, they kicked us out of the Hell's Canyon, giving the sheep the radius. They would come in and test them. They said that if the sheep had nose-to-nose contact with a domestic sheep, they'd be dead in 24 hours. So, of course, I don't know any rancher that it doesn't have a little science in them and wants to do science experiments. So we actually had one come in to the band. Mm-hmm. And they, he lasted two weeks. We were supposed to shoot him right off the bat. Yeah. We didn't. We let him go for two weeks. But it was during breeding season, and he was, started, he was breeding sheep wow. like crazy. And so uh, we, we decided then that we had better take him out. A lot of the sheep that they tested. Could they, that work? Could you have a bighorn domestic hybrid? I don't know how legal this is, but yeah. <laughs> what? Really? Yeah. That's interesting. We had a lot, actually. <laughs> no kidding. Yeah. Huh. So the, the bighorns continue to die of this bacterial pneumonia today, even though we're coming up on 30 years almost that sheep have been out of the canyon. Correct. A lot of the bighorns that die from falls, one of the sheep biologists here told me that she'll write that down as a bacterial pneumonia cause of death because it messes with their with their balance and that there's no possible way for them to fall if they're healthy. That seems very presumptive to me. Well, you know, we were very saddened because I don't know anyone who would fight it if it was pure science. The the couple of things that we ran into is we had we had some people coming in. We had three bucks that had come in and they were sitting right there by the ranch. Um, they had been, you know, um, they would come down with the box and even get in the crawl, you know, um, they were, they're super tame, really, you know, they're not, they're not super wild animals. That's kind of a presumption people think just because they're out there. They're very gentle. Um, anyway, we had them in there. They had some guys that were going to come in and dart them and take them in they actually take them to Caldwell right mm-hmm. next to the highway in the middle of the summer. So you go from one, you know, high, you know, low temperatures, high country down to the highway and they're feeding them alfalfa hay and watering them out of a bucket. Right. You know, you, and it's hard to take a wild animal that is been used to fending for itself basically. And then to put them in that situation and not have them stressed. Um, any stress will bring on a type of pneumonia mm-hmm. in any kind of an animal. But these guys, they already had said that they were diseased before they even had seen them. And that was, that was probably the heartbreak is they weren't, they weren't taking any of the information we had and, and wanting to work with us. If they, they wanted us out, that was the whole... Why do you think they wanted you out? Because they didn't want to have the domestic sheep in that type of, of land. They wanted it more for recreation instead of actually being used for something like that. And the the thing that's really troubling to me about that is that the recreation that occurs there, over 90% of it is just on the water. And Hell's Canyon is huge. The Hell's Canyon National Recreation Area is absolutely enormous and goes many, many, many miles away from the river itself. And people floating or jet boating or whatever, like, I just don't see how they could possibly be bothered by domestic sheep on the side hill that are improving the habitat for mule deer and elk and bear and every other thing. If you look at the uh, Oregon mule deer management plan, fascinating document, they specifically cite that the removal of livestock from these wild places caused a decline in habitat that is causal for the decline in mule deer. And yet we still can't reopen these grazing permits. It drives me crazy. Well, I don't think they understand the correlation between actually being on the land. It's better. It's like a, it's like a rental. Is it better to leave a, a rental house empty or to put someone in it? It's going to get taken over by mice. Mice and bugs and yeah. you name it, right? right. And, yeah. and predators, basically. Mm-hmm. And so they, I don't think they see the correlation in between having, you know some animals on the place 
and the fires, you know, like even if the animals are in there and there, and we literally could not stay more than one night in one spot. So, you know, our sheep were not camping in the same spot every night. We'd have to move them. Mm-hmm. And you'd only stay in, and it was a huge amount of area, but you'd camp in one spot for three days. Every three days we were moving camp. So the amount of time that you could even stay there was so minimal. I mean, we barely, barely grazed any grass Yeah. because you're moving so fast. Right. Another thing that I've noticed that has, has happened during this time is a lot of weeds have come come in there and sheep eat weeds so the the poison oak has gotten so bad that there's a lot of camps that you can't even stay at anymore oh really oh yeah i should go back in the kids are wanting to go back in and kind of do a whole you know memory down the lane kind of a thing and you know and see the spots because that's the one thing when you're camping out you get to see all kinds of little things that normal people probably wouldn't but um i want to talk to annalise and her dad if they'd be willing to talk about it too Mm. yeah that would be fun huh yeah I know. I was talking to Charlie Warnock the other day. Well, it's been a few months ago during basketball season, but we were talking about it. And, oh, man, did he have some cool stories. And we were chatting up but pretty good about, you know, the different spots in Hell's Canyon, different little memories, different, you know, trips and stories. And it was a lot of fun. But, yeah, because they were one of the first ones in Imnaha, you know, first families to settle. Mm-hmm. And, and uh, yeah, they had some really cool stories about all that. What do you miss the most? The miss the most is probably just the country you get to see, the wildlife, the goats, the bighorns, the the bear, the lions. Living like that is stepping back in time. It's it's not like, you know, if, if you don't have tortillas, you're not going to run to town to get tortillas. You know, you better open up a book and try and learn how to make your own tortillas kind of fast. You know, it's it's living like that it slows time down. I mean, we didn't have electronics. We didn't have electricity. We lived with propane lights, Mm -hmm. you know? So coming home, I did, I did miss the one thing I did miss down there was electricity. That that was nice to be able to come in a room and flip the light on is amazing. Quite a luxury. (laughs) I still have to chuckle from time to time when I flip the light on because it's like, Wow. You know, there's, there'd been times I'd come home and I'd go to light the lantern and <clears throat> maybe we'd been gone for a few days. Bats. Mm. The bats down there are insane. Yeah. Insane. There's still a lot of bats. Is there? Yeah. So did you guys ever, you know, when you leave your poles on back of the boat or mm-hmm. do you catch bats in those? Uh, It's happened to me. The, the only time I've ever gotten a bat actually tangled up in my line besides fly fishing. Fly fishing, sure. you'll catch them Absolutely. in the evenings. But mm-hmm. um, it was actually a, a, up here. And I had a rod that was inside of a woodshed that had two open bays. And a bat had flown into the line and gotten tangled in it. But the bats hit our line all the time when we're fishing. When we're fishing but there's yeah. nothing for them to get tangled on. Oh, man. The bats. One time we left the damper open on the stove. Mm-hmm. They come down through. Yeah. Filled the whole house up with bats. Yeah. We were getting bats out of the house until like two in the morning. Yeah. You know, doors, windows open, everything open, and you're, you know, shushing them out with a broom. It was insane. Insane. Um, tons of bat stories. But yeah. And there's a cave there that you can go back in. And dad was big on, on he knew how to, he liked to garden. And so once he found out there was this cave that had guano, mm. we'd have to walk forever, go into this cave, <laughs> go back in there. You're trying to be as quiet as you can, scoop the guano up to take it for back for his garden, you know? And it's like, oh, the bats, would. They, there was a big crack, you know, above where they like to sleep. And uh, yeah, getting back there and not getting bombarded by I don't know how many bats. There's so many bats in that thing. Yeah. Bats consist of about 20% of all the mammals in the world. Wow. So every fifth mammal on the planet is a bat. That's insane to think about. Yeah. And a lot of them are, you know, eating their body weight in insects every night or something ridiculous. Oh, it's like crazy. Yeah. yeah. But yeah, if you left a, we'd have to be real careful about leaving, you know, no fishing poles on the porch because yeah, they would, 
they'd get stuck in them. I don't know how, whether they just hit the line and then they'd slide down and get yeah. in the hook or I don't know, but you'd get them in the hook and trying to get them out of a hook is insane. Yeah. Poor little guys. Now we, we owe a lot to bats. I, I think that, you know, they're, they're the unsung hero of the world because we don't see them, you know, no, they're, you don't they're, see them at night. they're out at night and, um, they're just, they're doing such an important job in the ecosystem and we're, we're just largely unaware of their presence. Correct. No, the canyon's one of a one of a time space and in its own little dimension, that's for sure. It's um living down there has so many benefits and it and it has its non, you know, ice cream and getting a hamburger and different mm-hmm. things, you know. You had to do it all on your own. Mechanicing, that was another tough one. So if if we had a, a major shift in the Forest Service and they looked at it and they're like and we're, we're, we need to do something and we need to get sheep back in there. And they came to you and they said, you've got the, you've got the expertise. Um, we want to reopen this permit. We want you to have it. Are you going to round up a couple thousand head of sheep and head back down? Oh, I would in a heartbeat. In a heartbeat. In a heartbeat. Yeah. Yeah. To be able to shut down everything here and be able to go. Yeah. It's like, it's like stepping back in a book, yeah. you know? You, you don't get that anywhere yeah. else. Hmm. Well, these are, these are important stories. And I think that your perspective, having lived down in there, it's, it's hugely valuable to me. And trying to, to preserve stories like this um, through this show is, is, is important. And I know people are, are enjoying this. And, you know, if they've got a, uh, if they've got questions uh, or or want to say anything, is there a way for them to reach out to you? Um, sure. Yeah. Do you have an email or anything? I like have that? an email, uh, Leanna Wentz at gmail dot com. Okay. So if you've got questions about what it's like to to run a couple thousand head of sheep in hells, or you just want to tell Leanna thanks for making the the habitat better for wildlife for the years that she was there, send her a note. Thank you very much for your time. This is awesome. Oh, thank you. Thank you. It's fun to run a menace, so. Yeah, yeah. In the United States, there are about 15.2 million hunters. That's how many hunting licenses we sell in the country. And they spend around $21 billion per year, which breaks down to an average of $2,800 per hunter. Now, we need to be really smart about how we spend that money. You can't spend it on stuff that's going to break. Otherwise, you have to buy something else again, and you end up costing yourself even more. We also need to be smart about how much weight we carry in our packs because that's a serious limiting factor. One way to remove about five pounds out of your pack without sacrificing your ability to find animals is to get rid of your spotting scope and tripod. Now, there's a time and a place for those things, and I carry both of them a lot, but if I need to go lightweight... I'm going to carry stabilized binoculars and the best stabilized binoculars I have ever used are from Sig Sauer. They are the Zulu 6 and they just came out with a new pair called the Zulu 6 HDX. I use the 12 power magnification model. They weigh 21.5 ounces and they have two modes of stabilization. So you throw the lever forward once and that's going to stabilize the image. If you turn it off and turn it back on again, that's going to stabilize it even more. And I'm not kidding. It is more stable than if you're glassing from a tripod. It is absolutely incredible. You're going to be able to see stuff at just incredible distances and really break it down. Like you're going to be able to tell the difference between a Billy and a Nanny mountain goat at a mile. You're going to be able to actually see if there's a kicker coming off that four by four muley that just popped up over the hill. They work great at early and last light. They work great at highlight. They fit really well in my hands. Like this was one of the first products that I asked SIG to make when I started working with them. And to no surprise, they were already on it. They were way ahead of me. But this is a really good piece of gear. I highly encourage you look into it. You can go to SIGSour.com. Look for the Zulu 6 HDX. comes in a few different magnification settings. But the one that I like the best is the 12 power. Check it out. Thank you all very much for listening. I'm going to keep bringing you these stories 
from normal people just like you who have done extraordinary things. Everyone is an expert at something and they have interesting perspectives on life and work and the environment and all the things that we care about. I'm going to keep bringing that to you. And I want to thank you so much for making this show possible. I also want to thank Emily Bratcher for producing this show. She does a great job editing. Really appreciate her. I want to thank John Chatelain. He did the art for the Six Ranch podcast. And Celia, soon to be Harlander, uh, she digitized that so that we can get it out there on the internet for you. Also want to thank Justin Hay for writing this original music and the beautiful whistling that you're listening to right now. You guys are awesome. Thank you so much. Please keep listening to the show. Write me a review if you feel like it. And just keep doing your thing and we'll all learn from this together. It's been fun and, you know, we're, we're just getting started.